Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel on art history. My name is Maria Alekseva and today I am going to tell you something about the greatest Dutch artist of the 17th century and probably of all times, Rembrandt. Thank you very much that you found time uh, and joined this online lecture on a weekend. I really appreciate this. If you are for the first time at this channel, you might go afterwards and scroll down the videos that I have already published. There are many videos. Most of them are, however, in Russian. Only one so far is in English, but I promise everyone that in the future I will make more English videos and I'm already working on some of them. And please use the chat that you see on the right hand from the video uh, display to ask any questions, to write any comments, just to say hello <laughs> to me because I'm always happy to see who is watching my lectures, who is there with me today. Um, how long is our lecture today? It's hard to say because sometimes I just go so into the topics that I can, um, it can last longer than I uh, expect. But this time I really, I will really try my best to not to make it too long. But of course, in case you are busy or just tired, you can leave any time, but come back and watch the record of this video. Hopefully, if everything will be all right, uh, if everything is right today, um, this video recording of this lecture will be available on the same link on my YouTube channel. Okay, I see already some comments. Thank you. Hello, hello everyone. Um, yeah, and one more thing for you to know. Um, maybe some of you know that YouTube algorithms are a little bit confusing sometimes and it might happen that this certain video lecture would be blocked. Why? Because I'm going to show you some paintings with nude bodies. Yeah, it's quite difficult to be an art historian and doing the lectures on YouTube if any nude body is blocked, banned by YouTube. But it really happened many times with greatest artists of the 16th, 17th, 17th 19th centuries so, in case this happens, don't worry, I don't disappear. I have created a separated, um, another one, yeah, additional um, YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, stream, online stream. And I posted link to it in the description and also in the chat. You should see it right now. Right now, there is nothing there, just a link. Better uh, if you want to watch this video till the end today, watch this lecture, just open this link or save it somewhere so that you don't miss the rest of the lecture. And in case this happens, that means that the automatic recording of this lecture will be now available on my YouTube channel. But the good thing is that I am recording this video for you with an excellent sound. And in some, in some time, I, I, I cannot promise when exactly, but I'll try my best to make it, to do it as soon as possible. I will post the full length of video then on my YouTube channel, but it will be sometime later, not this week probably. <laughs> um, hopefully 
nothing will happen and we will stay all as we are now and yeah i will always uh, appreciate if you comment if you leave some comments in the chat box so that it will give me some um feeling that i'm speaking to people not speaking just to, with my camera well anyway um also what is a um, good thing <laughs> uh, that of course this lecture is open to everyone so you, anyone can join this anyone can um can see this lecture anyone can share this video please do so it would really help me if you share this link with your friends maybe post it on your facebook maybe um, send it to friends who are interested in art but of course uh, since art history is my profession i uh, do it now on voluntary basis but if you have opportunity please um, just donate a little bit maybe uh, imagine that we are doing this lecture in real world offline and you came and bought some ticket the sum can be any <clears throat> as big as you can <laughs> afford or as small as you want doesn't matter and in the description you see you can see all the uh, different forms different options uh, that you can use uh, of course paypal of course bank transfer bank transfer for those ones who live in europe it will be very easy and without commission in euros and the ones of you who uh, lives in russia can also uh, transfer me something in rubles on Sberbank or on Tinkoff Bank. So please choose whatever is um, easier, more con convenient for you. And uh, the second thing that you can do, uh, and it's maybe the most important thing, is that you subscribe to my channel. And maybe just right now like the video and we will begin okay so all right let's start then it's me here again <laughs> um all right so rembrandt rembrandt van rein this is his name Wait a second, I will open my presentation. So, on the display now, you can see his um, date of birth and date of death. So, yeah, he has lived quite an average life, but his life itself couldn't be considered as an average life. Um, the ones of you maybe who watch some films about Rembrandt, maybe read something about him, maybe even watch some lectures or started his works, know that this person uh, really suffered in his life a lot and all his life events reflected a lot on his artworks. Maybe more than of anyone else. This is a very interesting thing because when we study art history, when we consider artworks, we usually, of course, go a little bit uh, deeper into biography and of an artist if the one is available. Of course, in the 17th century, we already offer painting, offer painters of the 17th century, we already have some information, some. Uh, literature, even contemporary um, works, um, articles written about the artist and so on, some letters and documents. But sometimes you hardly can see um, very, very um, intensive relationship, intercommunication between 
the life events and real works of art. I mean, of course, it exists, I believe, at, at the artist life of any painter, but Rembrandt is the person who, in his artworks, showed himself. It was sort of, maybe, yeah, if we use the very popular word now, it was sort of art therapy for him. And this was also the reason why he was not um, successful enough for his talent. Because he was maybe too, um, too open, too sincere and didn't think enough about what audience expect uh, him to do and so on. So, Rembrandt, once again, yeah, who was this person? Okay, he uh, was born in Leiden. Leiden is a very important uh, city in the Netherlands in the beginning of the 17th century, in the end of the 16th century, in the 1575, 1575, the university was founded, so it was a university city, and Rembrandt started for some time at the university, but then quit it in order to work as an artist. And uh, who, who was his teacher? Yeah, I mean, of course, he had many different mentors, teachers, and so on, but no one of the mentors influenced him in the way that we can really say that, yeah, he is the student of his teacher. Yeah, um, Rembrandt, we can, what we can say that Rembrandt uh, learned more from nature, from observation, and especially observation of himself. He was the one who, uh, for all his life, studied himself, painted and drew himself at all the stages of his life. So here we can see his early self-portraits, different ones. We see more neutral, I would say, you know, just with some neutral face expression. Some of them are showing us the certain face expressions, for example, um, when he was laughing, when he was annoyed or afraid. Also, he um, depicted himself in different graphic techniques, especially in the print uh, art, gravure, yeah, and this certain um, type of gravure, type of, um, of um, print art, uh, we will talk more about this a little bit later, was called etching or fort or radierung in German. And those portraits, they are very, very small. And uh, yet we can see all the details because he uh, tried to focus on the details. This was very important to him because we will see that also in his even later works that details rock. <laughs> um, yeah, why he loved so much depicting himself? Not only because he was some kind of narcissist, probably, we don't know, we are not trying to make an a diagnosis today, but he was always available model for himself. You know, if you are a young artist, you are poor, you are not experienced enough, you need a model. You need to pay a model. You have to pay uh, this person. But if you have yourself <laughs> available and a mirror, you can just always do this for free, right? 
isn't it bad? Okay, look at those ones, for example. I believe the one on the right is really peculiar. Some of the portraits are not just some random depiction of face faces. He sometimes also shown himself dressed in armor, oriental uh, dresses, or some old-fashioned costumes. Yeah, so he often represented himself as a character. This was also sort of a um, key line in his career. Okay, so uh, what happened next? Next, yeah, he arrived to Amsterdam. He arrived, arrived to Amsterdam and Amsterdam, of course, was the capital of art market. And in, Mar in Amsterdam, he could apply his talent. He could really do something great because Leiden was already too small for him, too narrow. Yeah, and uh, what we should know about that. The 17th century um, art market in Holland, we're speaking about Holland, yeah, the part of the Netherlands. The art market at that time already reached the very, very high level, probably the highest level. Maybe I'm... I'm over uh, rate this but in my opinion it was even higher than in Italy at that time already in the 17th century and not speaking about the 14th, the 15th the 16th century but the 17th century Netherlands were on the top so what uh, was the um, yeah the key point of art market in Holland art business in Holland that um, Art market brought to total division of or all kind of art labor, where each artist was responsible for working not only in one genre, genre, yes, yeah, so portrait, landscape, still life, and and many 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 others, yeah, but also even in the theme uh, of a genre, so sub-genre. So just imagine, if you're an artist in the 17th century Amsterdam, you, let's imagine you're not as crazily talented as Rembrandt. We're speaking about some more like, um, yeah, average artist, okay? You choose your genre, how you choose what you can do best. For example, I can I can depict subjects very well, objects, not subjects, objects very well, the things. So I choose to work in the genre of still life, naturmort. Yeah, but it's such a big genre. It's such a huge field, and it will be very, very difficult for me to find a niche in this business. It's very, actually, it's very relevant now, for now, for nowadays, yeah? If you do anything, you are, yeah, you do lectures, art history lectures, you do blogs, you <laughs> do this, that, and that, and that, you are probably uh, not very successful person. Well, um, but if you choose a certain little small niche in this profession, then you probably can be the best. You can be on the top, or at least one of the top ones. So I, I can paint objects very well, but I will not paint all the objects, all kinds of still lives. I will only paint fruits, fruits because I do it the best. I am the best at painting fruits. And not just fruits, sorry, fruits. There are so many fruits. I am the best of painting exotic fruits. Some oranges, 
pineapples maybe. Another friend of mine, colleague, who also works as a natural mode artist, still life uh, painter, he would or she would, <laughs> most likely he would uh, work uh, in the subgenre of dishware. He would paint only pots, pans, frying pans, yeah, something like that. Maybe some um, pottery. Another person would only paint, uh, paint glassware, only glass uh, dishes. This is very interesting. And just imagine, really, this uh, was like that. And um, this brought us to the fact that there were really too many artists in the Netherlands. So it was really difficult to be the best one. And uh, also it, um, it made art more democratical and you, uh, you don't have to be a noble person, an aristocrat to own a piece of work, a piece of art, uh, some painting, even if you're just a, some citizen, even even the maid, even the servant, some servants had paintings to decorate their small uh, houses, small rooms. Okay, so this is the art theme of Holland, of Amsterdam in the 17th century. And just imagine, uh, um, Rembrandt, Rembrandt came to Holland and it was quite obvious that he is in the top of the artist, even being a young one, young person, young artist, not so experienced yet, he could do a lot. And this also is some kind of um, characteristic of his career that Rembrandt is one of the few Dutch artists of the 17th century who used to work in different genres. He painted portraits, bibl biblical scenes, mythological paintings, uh, not pure landscapes. And, I know, sorry, landscapes he did. It's not, <laughs> he did landscapes, but more in graphic not in painting and graphic, maybe not really the uh, still lives, but uh, we will see that he could do everything, every, uh, he, can, he could paint everything as good as anything else. And he didn't have to choose his niche to continue working. So, yeah, if you have questions, please, let me know, okay? And yeah, let's see what he did um, in his first stage of uh, career. So we are speaking about the late 20s and early 30s. He mostly worked in the, he, he started, yeah? He started working in the genre of portrait. Portrait was considered uh, the most difficult uh, genre. I mean, it's it's really is because it's just you know you have to know a lot to be able to depict the to depict the person, not only uh, so that the person will look alike, but also we uh, that we could uh, see the personality of this person, right? But what he preferred doing. He painted a lot of, you know, this very exaggerated uh, face expressions. Tournier, it's called the hats of people. Uh, a little bit funny, a little bit peculiar, maybe uh, ridiculous, we would say. So he chose to show people of not of some noble cries, not um of them uh yeah it, it they were not 
um, commissioned artworks. Uh, he just tried to, we would say, photograph the certain face expression and he, of course, tried to learn through that. Yeah, so there was also some kind of way that he was learning by working. Okay, yeah. And then, yeah, let's see what we have here also. What he also loved, he uh, already in the late 20s, he started um, learning a lot um, about ancient cultures, about history of art, history of culture, of um, costume. He started collecting things. Uh, he was mostly interested in the Middle East, in the Middle Eastern uh, heritage. And uh, those elements that we see sometimes in his paintings, most of them stayed in his collection, in his workshop, and he gave, it, gave them to the models and depicted them dressed in some special exotic costumes often to make the paintings, to make the, the uh, sujet, the plot, the scene look more natural. This is also a very interesting thing because when we uh, go to any museum and see, let's say, some biblical scene, yeah, of, let's Let's talk about Renaissance time, for example, the 16th century. Yeah, We see Madonna, godmother with a child. We see Joseph. We see maybe some other uh, figures, some other characters. And what do we see? We see them dressed <clears throat> in contemporary clothes. Contemporary of that time, of the 16th century, of the 14th century, of the whatever. And uh, the background, architecture, people that are standing somewhere there, they also don't look like people from the yeah, beginning of this era. What does Rembrandt for the first time in history of art, I would say, almost for the first time, he tried at least to make the theme looks more historical, accurate. Of course, we cannot, we cannot consider his paintings as, as a document. When we look at his uh, figures, we will go through them. I will show you a lot of examples. We will see, ah, here probably this is, of course, of the maybe of Middle Ages. This is probably of the 16th century. This is uh, of his contemporary time this is of that of that of that but still at least he tried to bring some kind of atmosphere and the way how he did it he uh, used a lot of artifacts that he bought at some uh, markets yeah those middle eastern objects and this was very exotic for the netherlands and it made the theme already looking look uh, quite authentic. Of course, not for the 21st century. We have now all the documents, we have all the archaeology and so on. They didn't have it back then. Okay, so, yeah, what else he does in the beginning of his career in the early 30s? He uh, started getting portrait commissions. Yeah, how he made it work? First of all, not only because he was, yeah, he of course because he was talented and so on, but he was also lucky. He could get a place and a very uh, successful organization, artist, uh, <laughs> artist union, so to say. So uh, this was um, 
kind of um, this was a building, yeah, there was an organization where several workshops were were united together, and they had so sort of um, PR manager there, the head, the owner of this of this um, unity. So it's not like he was the boss of them, but he was the one who was working on a business things. And the artists, they were working on working on actually on painting. But the person who did the most maybe boring for artists yeah, work, but actually one of the most difficult one was Hendrik Ellenborg. Hendrik Ellenborg. We'll talk about this Hendrik a little bit later. And this uh, union was quite good, quite successful. So they had connections. It was very important because uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of artists. And who got the first contract? Yeah, got everything. So we see that he uh, started working as a um, portraitist, portrait artist. And... People who chose him uh, to be there to depict them were mostly people of a new time. What does it mean? It means that they were mostly scientists, poets, philosophers, artists. So not just some aristocrats, but people of the intellect, of yeah, some yeah, some other kind of people and we see a very nice portrait uh the scholar at the desk and here we actually see a very typical portrait for that time what i mean we see a person who is busy with his work yeah we we can guess even without reading the title we can guess that this is a scholar this is a person who reads a lot who writes a lot later he will refuse doing such obvious giving us such obvious hints he will show just a person i will show you now he will show uh, us just a person without any accessories any yeah like here for example on the right jeremias jeremias the decker this was a poet a philosopher was a scientist look at the portrait on the on the right would you guess who is it well if you look in the eyes of person probably if you try to capture his yeah his sort of story of his life in his eyes but there is no obvious information on this person we don't see him um having a book look jan 6 by window 1647 before yeah this is the um engraving work but we see here uh, the person is reading okay this person can read this person <laughs> supposed to be um probably someone who yeah who is who belongs to this uh intellectual mm -hmm. yeah the uh, intellectual circle well um let's come back to this early works Yeah, so we have looked into uh, deeply into this work, and now I'm showing you a very famous group portrait. Probably many of you know this work. Maybe some of you even seen this work in life. If you've been to the Maurits Heus Museum in the Hague, please write it in comment. I've been there a couple of years ago and I must tell you this is one of the best museums I have ever, 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 ever visited in my life. And trust me, I've been to a lot of museums. It's a very small, little, tiny museum but filled with so many masterpieces that you would just, 
you would just <laughs> probably suffer from yeah Stendhal syndrome <laughs> okay so this painting um yeah make will make him would make him uh, really famous and uh, later brought him lots of new contracts new commissions so this kind of portraits, it's a typical corporate, uh, corporate portrait. Uh, in the Netherlands, there were many guilds, uh, different professional, professional unions, and each union had uh, their own building, and uh, they wanted to have portraits of uh, current members there and of course <clears throat> they um, posed for such portraits usually by either just by posing simply or by showing how they do their work like here we see the chirurg surger, uh, surgeon surgeon no the person who does surgery, <laughs> um, chirurg in Russian. Yeah, and look at this detailed details that uh, show um, everything without any try to hide some unpleasant elements. Um, important is that every person depicted on this painting, except the one that is lying on the table, <laughs> um, paid equally for this work, yeah? So they all sh um, gathered money and paid the artist to make a sufficient portrait. Remember that, keep this in mind uh, till we speak about the most famous work of Rembrandt, The Night Watch. Okay, so Rembrandt has become the first portraitist in Amsterdam. Very po popular, very successful. So this work has made him a star. Oh yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so what we see else we see another example of a corporate portrait. This is already a syndex of the Drapers. You can read a little bit more in internet later if you are interested in what those people did. Yeah, quite quite important organization at that time. Yeah, and we see again each person is shown quite equally. Even so, there are some people who are on the first, in the first row, some people in the background, but still the size of the head is the same. Very good portrait, professionally made. Again, this is already a later work, yeah? I'm showing you the one that is uh, made in 1632. And now I'm showing you the one that is was made 30 years later already in the period of of quite yeah of, during the quite unsuccessful period of his life. Well, a little bit later about that period, but still this portrait is also oh, sorry is also kind of a typical for that time. We see these details. We already see what. Rembrandt would use later it would be his mark yeah it's very very expressive painting style imposto it's called you know when you when you take a big brush or even you know this kind of mastihin I don't know maybe uh, it's a wrong word in English and Russian it's mastihin if you know the right term please write in the comments so this kind of metal thing, metal plate, and you just put the, you apply the, um, 
yeah, pieces of paint on the canvas, it don't work like it was before, you know, with little small brushes and you work very um, on very tiny details step by step. He worked like expressionist of the 20th century. He was quite, yeah, he was quite futuri futuristic for his time. Why this period, 30th, was uh, so successful also for him? Because he uh, met his uh, beloved wife. Whom was his wife? Saskia van Ellenborg. Remember, I already mentioned this surname before. Henrik Ellenborg was kind of producer, PR agent, art dealer, the one who was actually searching the contracts, the, yeah, who dealt the, dealt the business. He was her cousin. So he met Saskia uh, at the workshop and he's getting married to her uh, in 1634. Yeah, she was 22 years old and she was very, very rich woman. Saskia was born in Levarden, Le uh, Levarden. Uh, her father was a mayor of this town, uh, mayor, but um, her parents died quite early and at the age of 21 she moved to Amsterdam to her cousin Hendrik, who was influenced art dealer and yeah, he owned this big workshop where and, and rented out the small workshops for uh, to different artists amongst Rembrandt. So 13, uh, 1630s were the happiest years of his life. First of all, I told you he was super successful um, artist. He got the most prestigious commission. Also, he married a woman whom he loved. We rarely speak about love marriages in old times, but this was an exception of this rule. He really loved Saskia. She really loved Rembrandt. This was, this was a big success, big happiness. And a good thing also was that he, he was a very rich woman. So, period of, yeah, the, the period when Rembrandt had to seek the contracts, profitable contracts for him, has stopped, has ended. Now he can finally dedicate himself to to searching the, his own style, his own manner, and uh, think more about art itself, not just earning money. Well, yeah, the thing was also that, of course, we can speculate a lot about this relationship, but uh, we must respect Saskia for this step by choosing Rembrandt as her husband, she, sorry, not she, he was no match to her, socially no match. She was a daughter of a mayor. She was a very rich woman. She was, she belonged to upper middle class. So she was not noble person, but she was, I mean, like or aristocrat, but, uh, but she was upper, she belonged to upper middle class. Rembrandt was just a talented uh, young guy, <laughs> but uh, the fact that she um, 
agreed to marry him um, show us that first of all she loved him so much and second of all she was quite a brave woman self-confident and didn't care so much what the society thinks about her yeah we got a comment about a successful love story that's true but unfortunately as it often happens happiness is not forever and this is the tragedy in Rembrandt's life and of course yeah we can now after several hundred years we can now speak about that the way like okay well but because of this tragedy we have a genius Rembrandt because before Rembrandt was highly talented extraordinary talented artist but his later works showed that he's not just an, a talented artist but a real genius and probably one of the reasons was that his beloved wife died quite early in 1642 second yeah but before she died let me show you some more works <laughs> showing her so you see that he was depicting her quite often sorry here we see for example uh on the right susanna and the elders here we don't see elders we see susanna susanna is uh, yeah one of the old testament hebrew bible um hebrew scriptures character uh, and the face of Susanna belongs, of course, to, to Saskia. Here we see a later version of this work. It's another painting, as you see, already 47, after the death of Saskia. Uh, this is the, the face, yeah, the woman is Gertie Dix. I mean, maybe it's not her, but I believe it's hers. I mean, no one says 100% that it's hers, but it's supposed to be hers. <laughs> we will, I, will show her, I will show you more uh, pictures with her face, and you may be argue that this is her. Anyway, this is another woman. And actually, this is also a very interesting thing about Rembrandt, that we... Uh, almost all the female characters are his beloved women. So we know at least three of them. Probably there were more, but we know three of them. Of course, Saskia, his only wife, only one wife was. <laughs> and two uh, women that worked at his home, his house as babysitters of his son Titus yeah one of them was Gerti Dix it's quite quite difficult relationship they had with her she later sued him for having her a mistress without marriage so he refused to marry her why he refused to marry her because this very also interesting thing. Saskia, as I told you, was, I would say, millionaire. Yeah, she was extremely rich woman, and she had had also yeah, a lot to 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 give to. Yeah, so he himself, Rembrandt, and his son could inherit a lot. Yeah, after her death, but she, uh, in her last will, in her testament, was written that. Rembrandt can use any of her finance, any of her money and so on, unless he marries. And Rembrandt has never married. And Gertie, 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 probably pronounced, maybe, 
not correctly, Gertje Dirks, Dirks. Uh, she, yeah, she demanded money. Uh, for, from uh, yeah, so actually it was like that. That yeah, she uh, she sued him. She um, complained, and it was a very long period of investigation, so on. And this also made uh, Rembrandt lose lots of his money, and he had to pay her, of course, some kind of um, bursary. Yeah. But just imagine, yeah, the law system of that time was so, yeah, unfeministic, I don't know how to say it, against women that she was even put uh, then in sort of prison slash mental hospital for that actions because uh, Rembrandt said that she was stalking him, she was bothering him, that she was demanding money and so on and so on and so on. And yeah, the court confirmed that she is insane and she should be kept. Well, that was the 17th century law, not so much different of any other law. <laughs> almost till the end of the 20th century and yeah so here we see another paintings two paintings of of uh showing saskia saskia as flora or demetra uh, the goddess of fertility of nature and you see that you can notice that that her Belly, belly is uh, covered by drapery. It is the sign for us that Flora, sorry, not Flora, Saskia was pregnant at that time. And some more details for you. Yeah, uh, their happiness was spoiled with death of three children short after birth. So three children died. Only one child survived. It was the son named Titus. He was born and the next year, even less than in one year, in half a year, his mother would die, die of tuberculosis. She died at the age of 29. And I would like to ask you to remember one date, one year, that will help you to analyze uh, paintings of Rembrandt in the future without me. Once you are in a museum, just look at the date. Was it... Uh, created before 1642 or after. If it was created before 42, then um, you will see that the painting is completely different. It has completely different colors, different um, mood. It was happy painting. Okay, sometimes a little bit cynical, true, but anyway, not a there is almost no hint of sense of tragedy yet. Because, of course, he was happy, he was successful, he was rich, everything what he, what he wanted he has. He has a son, finally survived. And everything crushed in 1642. After that year, we will have completely different life of of Rembrandt black depressed depressive life um, and very unsuccessful why because in 1642 he will create several works that would ruin his reputation exactly in the year of death of his beloved wife what works I'm talking about? 
before we start uh, yeah, looking more deeply into the night watch, I will show you one painting from the Hermitage Museum. This, this painting is called David and um, uh, uh, David and Jonathan, uh, yeah, the parting of David from Jonathan. David is this young boy with golden hair, and Jonathan is this little bit older man. Uh, what was this topic eh, about? Well, um. I will not tell you all this story, okay, uh, because it's too long and we will uh, go too, too deep into this. But I just want to tell you that the fact was that David, the King David, had to leave um, the country, the city, and he um, came to say goodbye to his best friend, almost like a brother. Jonathan и Анафан in Russian. Прощание Давида с Анафаном. Так эта картина известна у нас в России в Эрмитаже. And uh, Jonathan uh, helped him actually to to survive. Yeah, he told him that uh, yeah that uh, David is going to be killed, and he told him so. Uh, in that way he saved his life so and we see this thing of saying goodbye to people who love each other who cannot live without each other to boys to men but is it actually a man this person with uh, golden hair we don't know of course it's called david's parting from jonathan but not rumor said, this is really uh, what uh, Rembrandt attended to say, is that this painting... Hello? Hello? Okay, sorry. Tem mm -hmm. Temporarily something with my microphone. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So, uh, what Rembrandt intended to say to us is that here we see Rembrandt's parting, saying goodbye to Saskia. Look at the face of Jonathan. Do you recognize Rembrandt's in him? And this nice golden hair, is it not, is it not Saskia? Look at this. portraits of her. She was blonde. So this painting was created exactly in 1642. Some more works on the subject of, of King David. He was into this topic uh, uh, short af shortly after the death of, of Saskia, because, as I told you, yeah, uh, each time Rembrandt embodied his own experience and feelings through the paintings. And he chose for each episode of his life, for each event of his life, he chose a subject in the history, mostly biblical and my and mostly the Old Testament stories uh, that would correspond his feelings and his own story. And actually, we can also say that besides yeah, a few paintings, I already showed you Flora and I will show you also Danae, he has almost never chosen um, myth 
mythological plots, mythological texts to illustrate them in the in his paintings. So he really got um, yeah kind of yeah impulse uh, from the Old Testament, old biblical stories. Because, in his opinion, only the Bible let uh, show all the complex scale of feelings and emotional experience. So, one more. Look at the ice. There is almost no ice, like a, like holes instead of ice. Yeah, so Uria here understands that he's soon going to die. Rembrandt doesn't paint yeah, his eyes, you see. Um, instead of it, he paints dark holes because we shouldn't see the eyes of a person who crossed the line of life and death. Intensity of emotions. It's of course already 1665. It's one of his latest works. But as I told you, every year will be worse and worse and worse. He was in deep depression and yeah, he was already about... He was already feeling that his life is going to end. Yeah, and see, uh, here we already witnessed the change of his color scheme in the 40s and the 50s. He uh, mostly started using that darker palette, brownish colors, all the ochre uh, shades of colors uh, of course black and what probably is the most remarkable is um, his uh, virtuosity of chiaroscuro chiaroscuro is a play of shades and light Okay, now we are seeing the most famous artwork of, of Rembrandt, the Night Watch. Actually, the Night Watch is an official name. It's not the real name of the work. Yeah, it, uh, This painting, this portrait was called, you see how, the shooting company of Franz Benning Koch and Willem van Reutenborg, probably. And why it was called the Night Watch? Because in the 19th century, when this was studied and given the name, the name was given to this painting, uh, the painting was so dark uh, because it was covered by several layers of luck and also just uh, as a matter of time, yeah? Every every painting, every oil painting would uh, become darker after some time. This is just um, this is just how it is. Yeah, this is just the na nature. This is just the science. So uh, Rembrandt didn't intend to show the night theme. Actually, it was a normal portrait uh, depicted a group of people at the daytime. And what was it? It was a commission portrait. It was the portrait um, that, um, yeah, that was uh, sponsored, uh, commissioned by Amsterdam Militia Company. And remember, I showed you several group portraits, co uh, corporate portraits, that I called typical. And this is completely opposite to the typical corporate portrait. For the first time, there is no posturing, there is no even 
yeah, hands of posturing. It shows a, a vivid natural scene. Yeah, we see that uh, probably here it's not so good, well seen because it's quite dark. But here is the arch and the group of people uh, entering the the main uh, yard, the main hall through this uh, arch. And the problem was that, of course, he uh, he didn't realized all the contracts points he uh, made not what he was expected to to make remember i told you that the idea of the corporate portrait was that the group of people paid equally in order to have them to be painted to be uh, depicted on the group portrait and this painting would be uh, hang somewhere in the main hall of their guild building, maybe in the civil uh, hall. And what we see on this painting is that some figures are cut or put in shadows. And plus, there are some characters, some figures, that are considered to be extra, that are not supposed to be in the painting. Sorry, they haven't paid money. Let's call the, let's call the, yeah, the things, it's, it's not uh, all names. For example, this drama man, he is not supposed to be there. He didn't pay. Who is this guy? And why he's shown? Here and also he's shown quite well. I mean, look, okay, he, he is cut, but still. But what we else see, we see that some people are shown in the very, very uh, deep um, shadow. I will show you some more details a little bit later. So, and uh, look at this figure. Who is this person? What do you think? The painting was created in 1642. This person is, of course, Saskia. Why would he be, a, be Saskia? Why? Does she belong to this militia company? No. But Rembrandt couldn't help but depicting her he his heart was bleeding he, he he was dying of pain and and look she is the brightest spot in the painting look she's in the spotlight who is this girl asked people asked the people who paid him for this work and it was not a small amount of money remember i told you that Rembrandt was a superstar, and of course, of course, he was uh, well paid. And this girl is uh, holding chicken. What? Chicken leg? Why? Actually, she is depicted here as a market uh, marketing seller. So the seller that uh, was following the army. This is how Rembrandt explained the existence of this girl uh, the painting but also there was quite a <laughs> nice um, catch here she was she's having here you see she, she has the chicken and chicken leg was displayed on a um, company's coat of arms uh, and also she has a pistol um, behind known as Clover, and this militia company, militia yeah, company, was uh, called in Dutch Clovenius. And, yeah, of course, uh, his commissioners were completely 
dissatisfied. They refuse to pay. They even refuse to take this painting. So this painting was just somewhere lying and it took some time until uh, Amsterdam took this painting and hang it, hung it uh, on the walls in the town hall. It was only in 1715. And yeah, and also look at this dark color scheme. Of course, it became a little bit dark after some time, but still, it was not what they expected, not what they paid for. But uh, those customers who versed in arts appreciated this work. So, of course, not like everyone hated that, but most of them hated. Just look at this. I will show you something. Uh, wait a minute. I want to show you um, on the website of second. Oops, yeah, here. On the website of of Rijksmuseum in uh, in the Netherlands. This is the website Rijksmuseum, the main. Museum of Art, Royal Collection of Art. You can, I mean, there are ev there is everything there, so you can go to any artist. But we are now on the page of Rembrandt here, and look what you can do. You can click the painting and look such small details that you will never be able to. Um, see when you are in the museum because trust me this painting is surrounded by sort of uh, fans and you cannot come uh, closer look you can enjoy all the little details here you can also download these pictures you can save them you can screenshot them everything is available also on wikipedia there is um this, this certain uh, work of art is scanned in very high resolution. And I wanted to show you this, for example. Wait a second, it's difficult to navigate. Ah, yeah, here, look at this face. This person paid for his part, the portrait. And look what he got. I mean, okay, those two, they are bosses, they are... Chefs, they are shown quite well. Some of them are in some darkness. This is unfair. This is imposto. This very dynamic, expressive, um, expressive uh, way of putting paint on the canvas. Sorry. Those mouse, 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 I lost mouse. Okay. Okay, my mouse stopped working. Ah, okay, now it's working. And since we are already on this website, let's watch some more works here. Ooh, look how he paints. I mean, this portrait actually was one of the rare examples of commissioned portraits in his later years because I told you his reputation was completely ruined and this was sort of last chance given to him. Okay, this is uh, his uh, early self-portrait.
thanks to Rake's museum, we can really go and see all this detail so close. And yeah, you can check this website of the museum and see other works of art also of Jan Wehrmeer and so on. Okay, I'm coming back to the presentation. What we are seeing right now? This is the original size. It's, it's, it's a copy, of course. It's a copy of Gerrit Lund, uh, Lund, Lundens, a student of, um, of Rembrandt. Uh, and it's a very small copy. So this painting you would see in the same room, in the same hall as the Night Watch painting, right? But this painting uh, shows the real size of this work. Um, you see, this square is what we have now. This was cut. So two characters here were cut and they disappeared forever. Thanks to Gerrit Lundens, we know at least that they existed before. What do you think? What was the reason uh, why this painting was cut? Very easily. And very yeah, sad <laughs> reasons, I would say. Remember, I told you that in 1715, this painting finally was. I mean, this painting, I told you, it wasn't, it was never sold. Yeah, these guys, they haven't taken it back. Yeah? And it uh, became, after that, since. He, I mean, he was becoming already slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah, I mean, not yet, but soon he will become a bankrupt. Yeah, it became uh, Amsterdam property. And yeah, it was uh, temporarily uh, placed in uh, Archibusier Guild Assembly Hall, but not where it's supposed to be hung. And uh, yeah... In 1715, uh, this painting was removed to Amsterdam City Hall and it painfully didn't fit to the wall. The sizes, just imagine, the wall was too small and this is why they just took and cut the masterpiece. Oh my God, what monsters, right? And this is the 18th century. So, and... Trust me, this is not the only example in art history when the paintings were yeah, cut like that, destroyed like that, just because they didn't fill the wall, the size of the wall. And so that you know how it looks a little bit uh, in the museum. This is my photo. Here is a huge, I mean, not so huge, but big uh, room with painting of Rembrandt the Night Watch and then we see another room where we can um, see other paintings of Rembrandt and other Dutch artists. So yeah, once you are in Amsterdam, please don't forget to pay a visit to the Rijksmuseum. Um, if, you, if I may, I will uh, continue with telling you more about his other works. Uh, about the Night Watch, I can make an, just a separate video if you want. There is so much to tell about this painting. This is just a riddle. One painting deserves to, to make the whole lecture on it. Maybe I will not make a lecture. Maybe I will make like 10, 15 minutes video if you want that kind of video, write in the comments and I will make it, okay? Um, yeah, now we speak about yeah, the period of his miserable life when he uh, lost his life, after he lost his life, after he, after he uh, started losing his money, also because of uh, this uh, trial with Gertie Dierks. And also he was abandoned by uh, his previous patrons. 
some friends decided not to have any anything to do with him his reputation was ruined he stopped getting any contracts and the only sources of life that he had were money of Saskia that he had you know, in case he stays unmarried what he did I mean we can understand him too let's not judge Rembrandt um, sorry. yeah this painting I wanted to show you this one yeah this is Getty Dix let us uh, have some also understanding how this woman looked like probably you heard of this story about the painting on the right Danae it's an it's again um Greek mythology plot um very shortly Danae was a daughter of um of a king uh Acrisi, Acrisius and uh he the, the uh he uh, the oracle said to him that he would be killed by by the son of his daughter so by his grandson and this is why he had this huge fear and uh, he uh, kept his daughter in the tower closed completely um, he had no one to talk to <clears throat> except her her servant yeah her nanny so he kept her virgin so that she doesn't have a child who would in the future kill him. Of course, this would happen. She would have a child and this child would kill this Acrisius. But we are not talking about that future event. We are talking about what is happening right now on the painting. Danae is depicted here as uh, already quite an adult woman, as you see. She's naked, she's lying on her bed. We see on the background her nanny, her servant, her help. And uh, she raised her arm and welcomes light, piece of light here. Yeah, some, some light, um, flash of light. And what uh, is this? This uh, light uh, represents Jupiter. Jupiter. Jupiter, uh, the main god, uh, Olympic god, he uh, took the appearance of uh, golden light, golden rain, and broke into her tower her bedroom and yeah penetrated her with his with this light so he got into her and impregnated her very strange thing yeah well as most of the ancient mythology stories and we all know that uh, Zeus Jupiter, he was quite a, a loving person. He always found some nice earth woman. And, um, and sometimes he took the appearance of an animal. Europe. Yeah, and the bull. Sometimes he took appearance of a light or coins golden coins i didn't put here uh, for you uh, an example of of uh, this painting of this plot in the works of other artists for example Titian, because i was afraid that i will be blocked by youtube because i was blocked by that painting before by danae of Titian painting that is now uh, hung um, displayed in Hermitage Museum in 
uh, Capo di Monte, Naples in Prado, in uh, Vienna, Art History Museum and so on. Yeah, so this is why now I also close the slides with Tanai so that I am not blocked. And most of the time, uh, this subject is depicted like that. Danaya sees the coins, the golden coins, falling from, from the sky. And while her nanny is trying to catch them and get money, get money, money, money is falling, Danaya is shocked, surprised, and she doesn't understand what it is. And this is how it was, yeah, this is how it happened. This is how it went. And yeah, her son, the one that would uh, be born after this incident uh, called Perseus, Perse, by the way. Anyway, uh, what we see on Rembrandt's painting is that he tries to philosophically, a little bit philosophically, analyze this work. He shows not the, literally the gold, golden coins, but he shows the light, golden light. And also some scientists, some art historians um, think that maybe this was some kind of religious connotation that he shows that she was enlightened, she she got some kind of God. So God visited her, actually, literally, God, Jupiter visited her. But also as a Christian, maybe uh, Rembrandt also showed this, that sometimes, you know, you, you may encounter God presence, yeah, some kind of vision and so on. Well... Uh, what I want to tell you regarding this painting is that this painting in June 1985 was, was um, vandalized. 30% of painting was destroyed. What happened? One mentally ill criminal came to museum, just some visitor of Hermitage Museum. Uh, first of all, he uh, pierced this painting twice in the middle. And then he also spilled acid. Look at this photo here. It shows how it looked like so we would yeah after 12 years if i'm not mistaken 12 years it has been being um restored you see the names of restorers who worked some of them yeah maybe there were more of them but here on the pictures you see the names of course there was a high risk that we would never see this painting again but they could manage to do that of course what they did they had to partly repaint it so they just took some missing parts here spots and they repainted them yes this is not 100 percent of authentic Rembrandt's painting anymore but this is the reality and we had to we had to bring this painting to life again. This person, Bronus Mises, he was from Lithuania, it was part of the USSR back then, he said that his aim was to stop depravity. She was too nude, too... Um, appealing to him, too sexually appealing, she was too open, that she provoked him to this crime. He was put in the mental hospital and he wasn't put in prison because he was yeah, considered to be a psychopath, I don't know, mental ill, 
person and um, after some time already after several decades he was asked if he if he regrets of what he did he said no of course i don't regret i am against of pornography in art i'm against of depravity pochlist yeah against of this and she was so provoking she was so open nude naked and seducing she wanted to have sex and so on and this is not good for me and this is not good for art museum so this is why i wanted to destroy this work and also he said well and yeah since i destroyed it since i just uh, since i vandalized it so easily it means that you museum workers just don't keep your eyes so much on it don't protect your artworks this is why nowadays and yeah not only in hermitage museum but in most museums we have these paintings under the glass and i know that many people yeah really are against of this yeah they say oh i don't want to look the on the painting through the glass glass prevents me of of seeing the beauty of the painting itself i agree it's true it's it's a big pain for me also an art as an art historian and also it's completely impossible to take pictures to photograph the paintings when they are behind the glass but let's be honest better to have the artworks behind the glass and signalization than not to have them at all i believe you all would agree with me if you don't agree also right <laughs> it would be interesting to read your opinion okay uh, another woman in his life was hendrikje stoffels hendrikje this was quite also quite a happy relationship for um, for uh, Rembrandt. She also became back then already not really babysitter because Titus uh, grew up more like a maid, but she became um, very quickly his uh, mistress and it was also a big love it was not just yeah just some sexual relationship they really understood each other she became his best friend and uh, she is the face of uh, all his later artworks so yeah we see her here a very nice uh, beautiful woman and now I will take a risk and show you this slide. Uh, look at the painting on the right. I hope I will not be banned for it. It's uh, Bathsheba, Bathsheba, I believe it's pronounced, uh, Versavia in Russian. Yeah. I'm showing you very quickly so that my stream will work. Okay, everything is working. All right. So, yeah, you see this uh, here once again. Once again, the story uh, from the Old Testament. Compare this painting, Bathsheba, Bathsheba, Bathsheba. I should have looked how she's pronounced this this word. Um. Can compare this uh, plot, this interpretation of this plot, with the work of Peter Paul Rubens, also the 17th century. Okay, this was a little bit earlier. Yeah, this is the 1650s. This is 1630s. It's his contempor uh, contemporary. He's a bit older as Rembrandt, but still, here she's very free will uh is it going she's very happy she's even curious about what is going on 
yeah she's getting a letter here you see and yeah i mean she's not against of trying this relationship with uh, king david yeah she understands that it's not so easy how it looks like and that she might really uh, pay for this relationship for the fact that she had to become a mistress for um, King David by the way this story that I showed you before David and Uriah Uriah was he her husband and he was a general of King David and he on this pending he uh, realized that David is sending him to uh, to the trenches to the very very dangerous uh, battle where he would 99% die so that David would get his wife and it's not like his wife had any um, word to say and decision to make yeah, so it's quite, it's quite difficult. What he wanted to tell us by this topic, remember I told you that every, every plot, every story that he's trying to tell us was sort of representing his own life. Um, this theme... So Bathsheba, Bathsheba, uh, let me check, <laughs> pronounce, um, Bathsheba, she, uh, yeah, she actually was, yeah, sort of, she was not wife, she was mistress of David, and um, so was Hendrik here. Second... Sometimes I have problems with pronunciation, the words, so please don't be. How can I know how this pronounce? Okay, ah, here. Mm. Ah, be Bes Besheba, Besheba, yeah, Besheba, okay, Besheba, right. So, um, Rembrandt and Hendrik, they also were not married, and they were already qui quite grown-up people and Rembrandt who already lost his reputation before he now lives again with a woman whom he was not married to and she lived with him and yeah she was sort of life uh, sort of a uh, wife for him but again for that time for the society this was no goal this was really out and of course they were criticized by yeah by people of art cluster too and of religious people so this was a sort of question that Rembrandt asked to himself whether he had to accept this and go to this relationship because you know he was in love with with Hendrik here, but should he continue or not? And at this painting, uh, we see that Bathsheba received the letter where David invites her to come to her. He saw her sunbathing. Remember the words, uh, remember the lyrics of Hallelujah song? You were basing on the roof. And, um, yeah, and so she has to make a decision, sort of. She has to make a decision. Of course, it's not like she can refuse it. But now this is the crucial point of her life. Whether she says yes and her husband would be killed, but maybe she would save her life. 
or maybe she would say no and then her husband would be anyway any anyway killed but she would be also killed well a tough decision to make yeah so this is what rembrandt was thinking about so you see he takes a story that has fir first um so first layer is plot a story that is told the second layer is to um, that we try to learn something from it what is being told to us and the third level is when we try to analyze this uh, story and try to interpret it um, using our own life experience another wonderful painting just just nice painting i mean again yeah we can talk about each uh, work of art non-stop here we see this impasto thick impasto he worked uh, with paint with a palette knife uh, this is how it's called um, mastichina's palette knife to create this glittering sculptural sense of relief look the painting is not flat not just i i'm not talking about this um effect this um imitation of volume no i'm speaking about real volume uh, the pain itself has volume look at this yeah it's not flat the surface is not flat this painting is also here yeah on the website of um Of Rijks Museum, okay. Right. Let's enjoy this impasto. Impasto. Look, yeah. You can even see that those strokes. They have volume. you must go to the museum and see it by your own eyes of course but i believe uh, this tool on the website of the museum gives already us sort of yeah feeling of what later paintings of rembrandt are okay another interpretation of this plot look the girl is depicted um just normally like an average portrait you see but she is holding the painting frame like that look so the painting frame is also painted amazing i have uh, here i showed you I added my own picture that I made in the museum. Um, this picture shows you the volume. I made it that way so that you see that, that these parts are con convex. Okay, and yeah, some portraits he still continue um, creating also in his later life but most of the models that he painted were his friends like this Jan Stix for example here I already showed you this print and Jeremy's Decker um, very important thing what i wanted to tell you today is his etchings but we will start uh, with uh, this uh, photo 
it's the uh, museum at Rembrandt's house, house of Rembrandt, where she, he lived till the 1658. Uh, so he moved uh, there with his wife Saskia. Here is the website link. And uh, remember, I before I showed you several uh, self-portraits made by Rembrandt in this very peculiar manner. This is a print. This is like an engraving, but a little bit different. So, let me first of all tell you what engraving is. It's when you take a piece, uh, uh, when you take a plate of uh, metal and you uh, use the cutting tools and you literally cut the drawing. You draw, but instead of using a pencil or a pen, you cut the image and then you apply the paint or uh, ink and then you use the press and make the prints as stamps on the paper. The problem of this technique was that it's very hard to draw something on the metal. I mean, yeah, of course you can do it, but you cannot make a very, very dynamical lines like uh, when you like when you draw it with um, pen or brush or pencil. And this is why uh, in the Renaissance time, in the, uh, already in the 16th century, but the high point of it uh, was in the 17th century, it was popular to uh, make another kind of engraving that uh, also used the or fort. So it's actually, I will show you what is it. It's an acid uh, that you apply to it to, so that it makes the, um, the drawing a little bit more um, natural. So uh, what is the stages of the creating of the etching? Here, for example, in the Museum of uh, Rembrandt, you can um, visit the printing studio and you can even see how they uh, create the etchings using uh, the tools that are similar to that time. So, first of all, you have uh, the metal plate. Uh, usually it's a copper plate. Yeah? You take uh, it and you apply the uh, waxy ground. It's a special uh, composition, special material that would prevent the certain, so the areas that are covered with, with this waxy uh, substance, they will not be um, destroyed um, by acid. So it's uh, AC resist uh, composition. Then you take your cutting tool and you apply the, so here's this acid resist, resist uh, composition, and then you draw on this paste. So the, it looks like, yeah, like wax, like some pa paste. And just imagine, instead of cutting the firm, metal plate, you actually cut this very, very gentle, smooth paste. So it's very easy to draw, actually. And this is why we have this completely free style drawings. They look really like drawings that were made by ink, by pen. Here is just an example of contemporary etching so that you understand that it is not only a 17th century thing. Then you put this metal plate into the basin 
filled with a sip. Yeah. Uh, this is the basin. It would be filled with acid. And what is happening then? Um, the areas that uh, were that were cut, uh, that the areas that contain the drawing. You know, by drawing we remove this wax, this uh, acid resist wax. So those areas they would be would be. Um, they would take uh, I don't know how to explain it they would um, the lines would be thicker and they will be really lines that uh, they would later uh, get the, uh, the ink uh, that they will keep the ink inside um, and then, yeah, and then you uh, remove um, this uh, wax from the metal plate, remove, uh, clean this uh, plate, and you apply the ink. Here, you can see this page. I can say here. Here are the instruments. You take the ink and you apply, and the ink would go inside these uh, lines, these um, holes that were made by cutting tool and the acid. Yeah, acid made those lines really deep. In Russian, travit protravlenie. Um, then you again remove the rest of the paint. And put this plate on your press, and voila, you apply paper and go again and again and again. One um, plate with one drawing can have, yeah, several, I would say, uh, even up to 30, 40 um, prints. Then when it already washes a little bit away, you can again apply the drawing uh, on the same previous place and do it again. So this made uh, art um, multiply. So we have not only one existing example of a drawing, but we have multiple copies of this drawing. And just so that you know uh, that there are many different types of printmaking, uh, they are divided into three groups. High print, it's when you, uh, when, uh, when ink would stay uh, on the higher elements, cut out elements like here, so wood cut, uh, cut on linoleum then also opposite to high print is deep print when we cut out remove and make the uh, drawing by removing pieces of material so usually it's all kind of metal engraving stripe point etch, uh, etching mixed into just don't don't mind all these terms, it's not so important. Just remember that there are this kind of this kind of prints, and there is also flat print, is when we, for example, print something on our uh, digital print machine, like printer, or for example, when we take a piece of paper, but not like that, but you know, may maybe more glass or like this plastic thing, we apply here some. Um, some drawing by watercolors for example and then we take a um, piece of paper and just press it like that and we have here an image this would be called this would be called monotypia okay now it was maybe not the most interesting part of the lecture but I believe it's Anyway, 
important to know that he was also an innovator in the graphic uh, art and also in the printing art. He created lots of series of of um, of uh, yeah um, printing uh, different printing medias. He worked not only in of fort in etching and this was actually one of his sources also to earn money so after he after sasuke died yeah he worked mostly as a grafica okay and we are almost at the end i am going to show you a little bit uh, more uh, slides and then it will be the end so don't worry i know you're most of you probably are tired me too but I believe Van Brandt deserved to, to have a long lecture on. Yeah. So please subscribe to my channel. And if you, um, if you will to support me financially, I would be very, very thankful, very grateful. Art history is my profession, my job. This is the way how I earn my living. And any money that you send me today would go for my life, <laughs> not somewhere else. Yeah, and also, of course, um, it helps me to uh, buy equipment because you see I have a very good professional microphone, camera, all this equipment here, audio mixer, switcher, displays, everything to make my lectures and videos professional. Okay, so last but not least, the later works that he was working on in the portrait genre I mean were mostly portraits of of an older man sorry of older men uh, older people older men and women he really um, finished you know this was very symbolically because he ended up um, alone um, with almost no money to spend and almost no bright future in front of him. And what he had is his experience and his memory. All the, all the, yeah, all the greatest things were already away. And uh, those portraits, they are one of the they are greatest portraits in art history, trust me. Uh, those reproductions are probably not the best because uh, three portraits of uh, those four are from um, St. Petersburg Hermitage Museum and the photocopies of those paintings are usually very bad. Um, unfortunately, we don't have such websites like uh, Rake's Museum that allows us to see all the details. But yeah... What else uh, I want to show you? Remember, we uh, noticed in the paintings David and Uriah that he uh, showed the person looking at us, but not looking at us, actually. Looking inside of him. We even couldn't see his eyes, actually. I mean, his eyes are not closed, but his eyes are not open. They're just black holes and here we see the same psychological mm, motif they look at us they look in our direction but we don't see them their eyes are also just dark holes this is what we call inner watching so these people they watch inside themselves rembrandt is often called as a, one of the first psychologists in art history and this is completely true no one before him was so went so deep into 
human's personality, human's life, and especially human's pain, the source of pain, the yeah, I told you he was he, he the painting was also sort of a therapy for him and the way to understand life, uh, the way the way how life functioned. But also he, uh, for all his life, he has been learning uh, human nature, psychology, and of course, as a young man of thirty or twenty, who he couldn't do it because he was just himself. So young, so so ambitious, and maybe sometimes even silly, sometimes cynical, sometimes just living the day, today's day, and yeah. And look, uh, what I want to show you. Uh, this is a very famous uh, double portrait that he made in 1637. I mean, the painting on the right. That's the time when he was a star. He was in love with Saskia. Saskia was in love with him. They had lots of money. Everything was great. And he yeah, already started um, painting the, the subjects taken um, from, the, from, Bible, yeah? from the Bible. But he was too young, probably, to really understand, to feel it the certain way. And look, he wanted for a long time to depict the very interesting uh, plot, uh, the, pro the story of prodigal uh, son, Bludny Sin, and he tried, he tried in graphic, he tried in painting, but he ended up only uh, with painting the double portrait as, pro as the prodigal son and some prostitute in the brothel. Of course, we see Saskia and Rembrandt himself. So what we see, he is super happy, is really the person who enjoys his life, who really lives live the best, takes the best from the life. And yeah, Saskia also enjoys this. And everything is great. I mean, this episode really took place in the in the story. So everything was okay. But later he would finally be able to to yeah to gain his goal by making also one of the most famous and greatest artworks of not only his career but of all time. So this painting probably you have seen, especially if you are from Russia, from St. Petersburg, you cannot, you couldn't miss this painting. Uh, look, um, not 1160s of course, uh, 1660, 1675, Return of the Prodigal Son. So he chose not the moment when the prodigal son, uh, you know, enjoying his life and everything is great, he has women, he has many, no, he came back home with no money, even no shoes, nothing, and he then he sneezes in front of his father, who is already very old and also half, half blind. Remember the portraits of old men, where these men were depicted by looking to us but not seeing us like blind people? Yes, that's it. And we see in the darkness, in the background, uh, faces, yeah, this is maybe his sister, maybe some servant, maybe, I don't know, some female character, and there are two brothers of the prodigal son. They, of course, criticize father, the father for the decision to forgive the son. Of course, this is also some kind of symbol of uh, all forgiveness, total forgiveness. 
and yeah look at this uh, detail here we see two feet and one of the feet i believe it is this one here he painted it with his own finger like that and you see that you see this mark of course with the reproduction it's not so easy to distinguish that but trust me i believe this one maybe this one because here i cannot see well i know i would i would know it when i see it in the hermitage museum uh, why the prodigal son of course i told you this was a, a topic a theme that was um, interesting for him for a long time yeah here we can see that he tried to read uh, to tell us the story before in the graphic art and here we see this painting in the hall rembrandt's hall in the hermitage museum by the way the hermitage museum is owns one of the greatest collection of rembrandt's paintings in the world and second largest after the dutch collection so if you're into rembrandt St. Petersburg waits for you. And yeah, why else? Because, because uh, uh, I mean, he finished it in 1665, but it was, he was kind of prophet, yeah? Uh, his only son, Titus, died also very young, soon after his marriage, his own marriage. He, uh, yeah, he would, so next year his father would die. So Rembrandt overlived his son, his only son, just imagine. And uh, Rembrandt, he anticipated this probably. I mean, I'm speculating now, of course, we can say, no, how would he... But, you know, this happened many times, many times in uh, world art, in literature, that artists, writers anticipated something. They anticipated the death of their dear ones. They anticipated some wars, some events in world history. And probably Rembrandt uh, felt that something would happen. And, yeah, we see that. Uh, Titus was his angel. He often actually shows, uh, is shown as an angel. He uh, was portrayed for his paintings, for Rembrandt's painting, as an angel. Young boy uh, with wonderful um, blonde hair of his mother Saskia. Died 1668, one year before his father. Of course, this has completely uh, already broken his life. His life was already half broken, but this was already the last drop. And when we look at the latest self-portrait, we don't see anymore this laughing man, this really happy, uh, ambitious young provincial who comes to Amsterdam and knows that he would he would make it he would uh, win this city he would win this world and he did for some time we see um, an old person i mean remember he wasn't that old he was like 63 when he died but we see a very old person, a person who suffered so much that this sufferer couldn't disappear from his face. We see this pain in his eyes. Look at this, for example. Every time I look at the latest self-portraits of Rembrandt, I... I cannot, I mean, I wouldn't say that I cry, but I cannot really stop myself uh, from really thinking that everything that we have now can finish 
quickly. So we should appreciate what we have right now and what we, whom we have right now, the dear ones and so on. And yeah, what Rembrandt did for art is very hard to distinguish because he made such a huge revolution that, of course, being a genius artist, he wasn't understood uh, entirely by his cont uh, contemporary. It, it wouldn't be possible. And this happened to most of the greatest artists, real greatest artists, like Velasquez, for example. The most genius artists, they were usually outsiders. Van Gogh, Van Gogh, awesome. Do I love painting of Rembrandt? Of course I do. Do I understand them? I try to. I believe I haven't gained yet sort of point of <laughs> intelligence and also maybe life experience to really deeper understand what he wanted to say. Do I always... Uh, imagine, wish to uh, meet his paintings when I go to museums. Yes, I do. And the good thing that he has really created a lot of works. Thanks to Saskia and her money, he, even without earning as, as an artist, uh, yeah, professional artist, he still could allow himself, he could afford continuing working, buying paints, buying canvas. Of course, after his death, there were lots of debts and so on. Doesn't matter. We have lots of paintings of Rembrandt. You can go to Wikipedia page and uh, press the um, uh, page, click the page, list of Rembrandt's works and you would see that. And what is great that his works you cannot confuse with anyone else you know in when we study art history in at the universities at art schools we sometimes it's quite tricky we need to learn we need to somehow find the tools the ways how we can uh, distinguish one artist from another to remember all of them with Rembrandt there is no such problem and you can always distinguish Rembrandt also from Rembrandt's students. And this is another topic that I haven't even mentioned during this lecture. Because this lecture is already more than two hours long. But uh, Rembrandt, one of his also uh, really... Uh, yeah, what he has done for art history is that he, after himself... Uh, he left many super talented artists. Many of them were stayed as followers of Rembrandt. So their paintings more or less tried to look like Rembrandt without Rembrandt's genius talent. But many of them became completely independent and very unique artists. Maybe one day I will also make a lecture on uh, his students' works. Okay, um, if you have any question, please ask now. I can still answer them in live stream. If not, just leave the question after you finish watching this lecture, maybe as a comment. If you watch this lecture afterwards as a already record, I mean, I'm happy that I wasn't banned, then everything is all right. This video will be available on my YouTube channel, hopefully forever. And yeah, I would really appreciate uh, if you leave comments because I want so much to know your feedback. I hope I my English was sufficient for you to understand. I'm sorry. If you're a native speaker, it would be probably a big pain for you to listen to my English. I'm sorry for that. I'm not a native speaker and I am not even trying to 
look like a native speaker, but yeah, sorry, my pronunciation sucks. That's true. Anyway, um, the most important thing that I hope it would was understandable. And uh, also, if you speak Russian, then a good news for you is that uh, on Friday, next Friday, 26 uh, of February, I will help the lecture in Russia, also on my YouTube channel, on architecture this time. It will be about architecture of Vienna. starting from the first century uh, till our time, our days. So it would be overview of all the epochs, styles, period of Viennese architecture. It will be very, very short, very, very brief. So it would be not like five hours lecture. Don't worry, I will try my best to keep in maybe one and a half hour. Okay, so... Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for the compliments to my <laughs> English. And I'm very happy that there are still people who are watching you till the end. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much once again that you joined this lecture. Thank you for your comments, for your likes, for your subscriptions. Please, if you enjoy this lecture yourself, please copy the link and post on your social media uh, give opportunity your friends also learn something about Rembrandt and also you this way you can help me to to gain some more audience yeah it's always difficult for us for people who do such things to gain people to gain the audience to have more people more views and so on yeah and of course if you can uh, donate a little bit some some money on my PayPal or on my any of my bank account numbers if you want if you don't want or if you can't then just like this video share this video subscribe to this channel comment and yeah also one thing the last thing and I am saying then goodbye uh, many people tell me that you know I would I would love to subscribe to your ch channel but Unfortunately, I have no uh, YouTube account. Well, people, you know, of course, I cannot demand this from you. I cannot force you to make a YouTube account, but it takes two minutes to do so. And if you subscribe to my channel, you have no idea how does affect on my popularity. Because recently I had uh, I made some advertisement of my YouTube channel and I get, get like 400 new uh, subscribers and and I, I I get an idea that probably my videos also were in recommendations because there were some people who came definitely not from the the person from the blogger that advertised my videos so it means that when YouTube sees that the channel is viewed, commented, liked, off and so on, it would show to the larger, you know, to the larger audience. So, yeah, please support me by at least subscribing to my channel. Create the channel and subscribe. And also view the lectures, comment the lectures and so on. Anyway, yeah, I have another <laughs> compliment. Thank you, Daria. Thank you, Alina. Unfortunately, I cannot distinguish who is the sources 93. Uh, please, if you may write your name, I would personally thank you for that. Thank you once again. Yeah. Uh, Daria, don't worry. If you join the second half, you can watch the first half later. The video is here on this channel. Okay? Anyway, thank you very much. I wish you all wonderful rest of Sunday, uh, have a nice week and be healthy, see you next time on one of my lectures, bye bye.